My name's Daniel Goldburn. I'm the president of Walpert Jewish Hospital. Uh, we have an exciting evening tonight. Um, unfortunately, I think the attendance is a little lighter than normal, but I'm sure we're going to have a very informative evening. Uh, we have a wonderful panel, which will be, of, uh, as usual, moderated by uh, Julie McCrossan. Uh, the panel consists of Professor Luigi Fontana, Associate Professor Amanda Third, and um, Jill Margo, AM, um, and I'll allow Julie to uh, elaborate on their um, uh, details of their career and so on, their CVs a little later when Julie introduces them. Um, just before I um, introduce our partner for this evening, Maccabi Life, just to say a few words about Walper. Walper's a 54-bed, in case you know, no, and people in the audience aren't aware of what Walper is, it's a 54-bed not-for-profit hospital situated in Wallara, mainly involved in orthopaedic and geriatric rehab, a medical ward as well as palliative care. Um, as a not-for-profit, we can uh, facilitate, if you like, a better quality of care because uh, we don't set out to, uh, to make a surplus or make a profit, we budget for a break-even result. Uh, we are sponsored by the Sydney Jewish community, but uh, over 70% of our patients are actually non-Jewish, so it is open to all. Um, my next task is to introduce our partner for tonight. Our partner tonight is Maccabi Life, which is a new uh, initiative from the Maccabi Movement of Australia, which is, if people aren't aware, is a organisation that's been around for a long time. Um, 1920 something or other, so it must be getting close to 100 years. It's a Jewish organ, a Jewish organisation that's, that uh, sponsors sport within the Jewish community, and uh, this is a new initiative of theirs. It's a um, Maccabi Life to sponsor health and well-being. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carol Hertz, who's a board member of uh, of the movement. Carol, of course, uh, has a passion through personal adversity. Uh, to make a real difference in the health and well-being sector. Uh, testament to this is her roles as the non-executive director on the Australian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine, as well as Outdoors Inc. Uh, she's very keen to make an impact on the future directions of Maccabi life and enhance the well-being of members of our wider community. Before um, Carol comes up, we also have an attendance here tonight, uh, Dr. Daron Scher, who's also a board member of the Maccabi Life Advisory Board. Um, Daron is a uh, orthopaedic surgeon, uh, has a master's degree in biomedical engineering, and uh, he's um, here tonight. So if you want to catch up with a bit more information about Maccabi Life after they address it, both Carol is here, and Daron, would you like to just stand up to make yourself known? You could see either of these two uh, people after um, after the evening or during the evening. So without further ado, um, Carol Hertz and then I'll, it, Julie would just jump up straight after, if you don't mind, and take over. So thank you very, very much. Over to you, Carol. Thank you very much for that. Well, a very warm welcome to everyone this evening. And I guess you should congratulate yourselves that you've invested in your time to be here tonight and look after your health and your own personal well-being. And that's the intent of Maccabi Life. We are the new kid on the block. Uh, Maccabi, I'm sure for most of you, you have some kind of affiliation, a structured sport. And for many of you, you have a genealogy going back with parents, maybe even grandparents, and certainly your children and yourselves. But Maccabi Life's intent is to be advocates of health and well-being. And we've only just started. So one of the product offerings that we have for you is one that gets you moving. Maccabi Life looked at the data and it was quite painful. 56% of adults do lead a sedentary lifestyle. And only 19% of children between the ages of five and 17 meet the daily requirements of activity. Our children are obese. They are connected to their screens, hence that affectionate word screen ages for our teenagers. 
cancer is sadly on the rise. As we know, as far as health for our hearts go, that's another conversation. And omnipresent is diabetes and many other diseases. So leading a sedentary lifestyle is the fourth contributor of these horrific diseases. And Maccabi felt they could not sit back and allow this to continue in the community and then the broader community. And so Maccabi Life was born. And it's a privilege to be serving on the board. And a privilege because it is in its infant stage and we're learning from our consumers. One of the very first events that we actually had was on Sunday at Centennial Park a collaboration with Dementia Australia. Melbourne did the same, and there were 450 that registered. That's 450 more people that were active on Sunday morning. And dare I say, if you were in Melbourne at eight o'clock when you were registering, you were freezing cold. But they came, and they got moving, and that's the intent. Besides which, we did raise $50,000, and we're not complaining. But that's not the intent. The intent is to get our community and wider community moving. So tonight, before you do depart, I am going to encourage you, please, to take your passport to good health. And I call it a passport because it's like a credit card. It goes into your bag. And on here is a QR reader or you can be directed to the website. And on this Maccabi Life website is an opportunity for you to be rewarded for being active. If you walk, jog, swim, go shopping, whatever way pleases you to be active, you will be rewarded through registering and syncing with an activity tracker. Your rewards are that you'll be able to buy products and services at a reduced price. But on this portal are healthy bites. they little bits of information that are shared with you on a regular basis. I look quite forward to it. It comes into my inbox and I'm wondering what's the next best thing. It's the currency of medical practice. Which fats are healthy? The five best things to do to wade off diabetes. And the list goes on. It's user-friendly for us as the end user. It doesn't have much medical jargon, but it's evidence-based. So it's medically evidence-based. What I'm sharing with you tonight, I'm sure after a wonderful evening, a lot is going to be lost. So I've also got upstairs, after you've picked up your passport of good health, a flyer for you to do further reading. The next event that Maccabi Life has is towards the end of the year, and it is a health and wellness expo. That is our third flyer that we have for you. We would like you to diarise the date so that you keep the day free. We have a number of keynote speakers that we've already attracted, media personalities and well-researched presenters who are interested in looking after your health and well-being. It will be an interactive day and a fun day. It's on the 27th of October. So if you take the flyer and lock it into your calendars, we know that we will enjoy experiencing a wonderful day of good health. The information will be on the flyer and we're going to be encouraging you to be in contact with us through Welfare to keep in tune with what else we have on offer, to keep you moving, to not allow you to be sedentary, and to look after and invest in your health and your well-being. I'd now like to introduce you to Doron Sher. Doron is on our medical advisory board, the governance that ensures that we share information with you that is credible, and he's going to be sharing a few words with you. So thank you very much for investing in your health and coming to hear us tonight. And thank you to Ruth and to Walper for reaching out and allowing us to co-badge this event. Over to you, thank you. Um, thanks, Carol. Look, I'm, I'm not gonna take a great deal of your time. Uh, my uh, experience with Walper Hospital has been referring uh, patients there as a surgeon, and I have to do, say they do a wonderful job caring for their patients there, and congratulations to you. And, 
and uh, you know, I'll continue to send my patients there because they get so well looked after, and I'm sure you all know that already. Um, my involvement with Maccabi Life came uh, at multiple levels. Uh, you know, I used to do a junior Maccabeer when I was a kid, and there really isn't anything in that mid-range level, uh, in, in the sort of the middle adult level, uh, where people can engage. Uh, and we're starting to lose a lot of people in the Jewish community to, to intermarriage because they don't have a, a, an opportunity to link together. And if we are going to offer them something like exercise, we have to do it in a safe manner. And I guess that's part of where I came into it. You know, they were looking for expertise to say, okay, well, how can we do this safely? And a lot of my patients aren't able to exercise necessarily in one way, and we have to find a different way for them to be able to exercise, so have multiple options. And, and Maccabi Life really is, uh, you know, the idea with all of this is to have multiple opportunities to do things that younger people can advertise, uh, at, so can, can exercise harder. Uh, as you get older, you need to perhaps change the type of exercise that you're doing. Maybe you need to change your diet as well. And so really we are going to try and look at all facets of this to be able to uh, improve people's health. And I think it is something that's going to change over time and develop over time as we see what people need and uh, encourage them to keep moving. So uh, be very happy to answer any questions and just encourage you to, to keep your eye on the Maccabi Life page because things will develop over the next few years. Thanks. Thank you very much to both of you. Look, my name's Julie McCrossan and it's my job to get us moving. I promise to not sit down again until I complete our dynamic evening, which will be just before nine. I thought we'll begin with physical action. Steve, come forward. Steve Denenberg, he used to be a social worker, he used to be working in community services. He's so committed to fitness, he's here tonight. Do something physical, Steve. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go for three. One, two, three. Do one more and we'll cheer. Okay, go for it. Steve, I'm going to come back to you in a moment. I'd just like to get Cody Kane out. I don't want us to feel like we're just favouring an obvious fitness fanatic. Come out here, sir. We've got to be on the film. This will be shown to people lying in their beds, rehabilitating from orthopaedic surgery. And this is what he's going to do. Cody, of course, is a physiotherapy manager. He's involved with the Move Well program. Would you move, please, Cody? Uh, Push-ups would be great there, darling. If you can stand on your head, that's excellent. One, two, three. And they cheer for the fourth. Okay, go. Come over, Cody. Do you want to begin? Just before we get our panel out, so what is Move Well? What happens? How do I get to meet you at Walpa? Uh, I guess we have a large array of exercise programs. Like Deron was saying, we've got to cater for as many people as possible. So there's 48 classes that we offer. Um, it's open to anyone in the community who wants to come along. You pretty do I have to have an injury and get operated on or can I come straight to you? You can come straight to us and that's probably what we'd recommend because we want prevention more than anything, I guess, as well. Uh, especially after rehab is good, but beforehand even better. And I don't mean to be flip about rehab. I'm just, in fact, motivating people um, to, to recover from illness is part of healthy living too. What does that word healthy living, we're talking about that tonight, what does it mean to you? I mean young fit guy like you, what does healthy living mean? Uh, I think that's a really good question. I think it's just a balance, balance of everything, whether that's physical activity, whether that's mental health, whether that's nutrition, whatever it is, just a balance. And I think overall too, just enjoying life. How do you motivate yourself and the people you work with? Uh, well, I've got a young daughter, so getting out of the house is actually good for me for motivation for a bit of time out, I would say. <laughs> My wife's not here, so I can say that. So you sort of run out of the house and leave your wife and child. You so like tonight, for example, yeah. is wonderful timing tonight to get out of the house. But I guess just motivation in general is some activity. Um, getting out, Like I say, getting out of the house to be able to do some exercise, but then it's eating well, it's getting sleep, it's all those basic functions that we do throughout the day. Is there someone you genuinely admire? You think... I would like to be like them when I'm 50 or 60. Because you would work a lot with people uh, who have had falls, who have had injuries, and you're probably thinking falls prevention is worth focusing on. So who do you admire who's in an older age bracket that you aspire to be like them? Uh, well, I guess we're kind of lucky at Walp. We've seen a lot of patients there that you see great stories all the time. And you see people come from a sedentary lifestyle to having a knee replacement to 
becoming motivated to be getting involved in exercise and then you see them years down the track walking around the street with a smile on their face and you realise that they've taken all of that on board and actually practised it, which is fantastic to see. Are you telling me you don't get a single couch potato? Uh, we do, we do. We get lots of them. There's lots of them out there, but I guess that's what we're all here trying to motivate those people to get going. So what does motivate people who haven't had an injury? They haven't had surgery. They hear all the, the messages. What, what, how can you get yourself moving if you do not have a history of activity? I think that's a lot to do with education amongst health professionals because we're in a perfect position to get these people going in the sense that we just need to get them involved in activity. And I think starting with something is better than nothing. And then building on that is really important because that starting point, for whatever reason, can be a social reason, it can be they want to get fit, they want to get healthy, they've had a health scare, whatever it is, it's just getting started and then promoting that over time to try and increase it. Well, thank you very much. Can you give him a round of applause? <laughs> So introduce yourself and explain, you know, I pr could probably punch you and it'd be all right, wouldn't it? Will I do that? Yeah, hold, hold in. Yeah, I could tell just by looking at him I could do that. Well, tell us, what got you into fitness and, and what do you do to keep fit now? Because you're in the upper range, aren't you? I'm 69, I'll be 70 in August. Um, I've been training in one form or another for many, many years. Um, I was a servant of the Jewish community of New South Wales for past 40 years. Um, in what way? Uh, I was CEO of Jewish Care, uh, then an um, executive officer of Emanuel Synagogue, and then executive director of the Union for Progressive Judaism. Um, and that sort of came to an end. And I was going skiing with my daughter. And on the way back, she said, you know, you're quite fit for an old bugger. Why don't you put that, um, that interest and passion you have to use? And so I went off, got a, a diploma, and I've now become a dinosaur trainer. Uh, me being the dinosaur. Um, so I'm now working in, in the fitness industry, um, really continuing the same um, route that I had, which is to help people. Uh, in this instance, most of the people I work with are 60 plus, uh, some 70 plus, and really uh, working with them to try and not necessarily make them into toned, uh, strong people, but make people able to maintain uh, a lifestyle of comfort and health and to answer your question that you asked Cody, um, the things that I think people really want to get out of it is the confidence to feel they can walk downstairs without needing to grip the handrail, uh, the ability to walk through a shopping mall without wondering if they're going to slip over, fall over, break a knee, hurt their hip or something else, and the ability to know that they can actually play with their grandchildren, get down on the floor with them, get up, even pick them up. Um, they're the simple things that really motivate the people who get it with me. Uh, and what we work towards is overcoming the physical and other disabilities they may have developed during their life so that they can maintain uh, a lifestyle of health. So you're putting quite a strong focus on, on the family and on relationships. Uh, can I just ask you, you, you began by describing the community service roles that you play, both voluntary and paid. Does your definition of healthy living go beyond the physical, and if so, in what way? Uh, well beyond the physical. But the physical is a, is a basic element. If you don't feel physically confident, if you don't feel physically well, then it's really difficult to have healthy relationships because you're always feeling, I'm not quite there, I can't quite relate, I can't, I can't talk to people, I don't feel part of it, I don't feel I'm up to it. Um, social things such as playing golf, um, going out at night, being able to sit down for a few hours, play bridge, do just generally doing things that are part, maintain your role as being part of an active community. Look, thank you so much. Would you give him a round of applause, please? <laughs> and I, I will be opening up to questions shortly. I thought I'd just introduce you to our panel. If I could ask our uh, three panel members to come out the front. Jill Margo AM, if you could take your seat, and Jill is health editor with the Australian Financial Review and author of six books, and she has a special interest in men's health, including prostate cancer awareness, if you could make her welcome. And our Associate Professor Amanda Ford is from the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University, and she's involved in many research areas, but in particular, 
uh, Young People, Technology and Wellbeing, and she's involved with the Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre. Would you please give her a round of applause? And welcome also to Professor Luigi Fontana, who's a Professor of Medicine and Nutrition uh, based at the Charles Perkin, Perkins Centre in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. And he's the Leonard P. Allman Chair of Translational Metabolic Health. Would you please make him welcome as well? Now, I think we've got a, a microphone on here. I might start with you, sir. We've, we've begun, uh, I guess, with very much the practical, physical, as well as what you might call the psychosocial. Uh, Professor Fontana, if I, can I call you Luigi? Is that okay? Yes, yeah, thank of you. Of course. <laughs> thank you. Um, you're, you've done a lot of work on how to reduce damage. Can you explain what sort of damage and how do you reduce it? Well, you know, what we have been uh, studying for years now is why, <clears throat> why we age and why we develop all these diseases that are age-related, you know, from dementia, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and uh, what we are finding that aging can be regulated and that nutrition is the most powerful intervention to slow aging and to prevent multiple chronic disease. We, we've heard a lot about exercise, Put the case for nutrition. Why is that the well, most so significant? My, my, my mentor in the US, John Holosey, that won the gold medal here at the, uh, the Olympic uh, Sydney Games in 2000, he did a study uh, where he compared exercise and uh, uh, calorie restriction, di dietary restriction in animals. And what he found is that basically exercise is important to keep as people said, strength and, 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 uh, and, and, and improve health, metabolic health, but it doesn't extend maximal lifespan. Only diet, so if you reduce calorie without malnutrition, you extend lifespan up to 50% longer. It means that a human being, instead of living 80 years, will live 130, 140 years in good health. So exercise is essential, but is not slowing down the accumulation of damage and is not basically uh, in improving lifespan as, as, as a diet does. And, and so when you're talking about damage, are you talking about damage at a cellular level? What damage to what? Yeah, basically, you know, when we are overeating and we accumulate excessive abdominal fat, we have inflammation, we have insulin resistance, we have the production of hormones that are driving the accumulation of DNA damage, cellular damage, mitochondrial damage, the accumulation of garbage into, into our cells, into our tissues, that is leading to multiple disease. To 80% of the chronic disease we see in our hospital are preventable. And that's why, you know, I came to work in Sydney because, you know, we want, our healthcare system that I call sick care is unsustainable because the population is getting older but is not getting healthier. And you know, financially, it's unsustainable to get all these people old and sick and to treat them with drugs and surgery. And that's what we do now in the medical system. All the physician health professional, they know very little about prevention. And we just train our, peop our physicians to make diagnosis of disease that typically take between 30 and 40 years to develop, and then we treat them with surgery and drugs. Just to make an example, it's like, you know, instead of changing the transmission belt of your car when it's around 90,000 kilometers, you wait to, to, for the car to, for the transmission belt to break, and then, you know, what you do, you go and try to diagnose how bad is the damage, and then you are trying to fix the damage. Ideally, what you should do is to change the transmission belt so that you don't, you don't, you don't crash the engine. Now, I've just had a quick look at the audience. We are slipping into an older age bracket here. I'm just going to slip in front of the camera to the other side. Is it ever too late to reduce my calorific intake? Well, it's not only calories. You know, it's, it's getting a bit more complicated. You know, we're, we are finding, you know, that protein intake and certain amino acids and, you know, the, the gut microbiota by changing the immune system. So it's, it's a bit more complicated, yes. you know. But, but, but it's never too late. It's never too it's late. It's never too late. The sooner the better. Aging doesn't start at 65 years old. It starts in pre preconceptional age. Already, you know, what we do now as young individuals 
is shaping the epigenome, so how, how, how our genes are working, and so we are increasing the risk of our kids, grandkids, and grand-grandkids to develop chronic disease. Okay, so that if I st I'm 65 in October, I haven't applied for my senior's card, but I am any minute, if I am completely accepting his argument, and I'm going to ask you for the practical steps in a minute, I can help my children and my grandchildren if I take these steps, if I change my belt inside my inner car. Well, no, because I don't think at 65 you're going to procreate. Ah, too late. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell my daughter who's planning yeah, exactly. a baby your next daughter, year. Your daughter, exactly. She's a, she's a general practitioner. She's keen on, yeah. on primary care. So... Can I ask you, for, let's imagine that some of us in here are within the age bracket still to have children, and there are some, I can see them. Well, for any of us, what are the two or three practical things we need to do to increase our longevity, but would I be right in thinking we want to have a reasonable quality of life? We don't just want to go to 130? Would that be right, guys? I think so, because a number of us have been visiting our elderly parents, so there's more to life than length. But if I want quality life and it's long, two or three things. What are you doing right for yourself in your own lifestyle? Look at him, he's as lean as buggery. Well, again, you know, you should, again, try to avoid the accumulation of abdominal fat. You know, when you start to see that, you know, your waist circumference goes up, okay. you know, that's a sign that, you know, you have inflammation, you have all these abnormal hormones that are driving this damage and, and, the, and the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and many other chronic disease. Okay. And, and therefore, you know, to do that, you know, you have to have exercise is important, but you know, if, unless you exercise probably five hours a day, you are not gonna be able to, to, uh, to, to block, you know, the accumulation of fat and abdominal fat. And then it's basically, and, and therefore the, the second is diet. And diet, you know, just to make a simple statement is basically to control our calories without malnutrition, there are, a few examples. One is basically to move from a refined, high animal, high animal food diet, you know, versus a Mediterranean diet, yep. you know, typical of Israel, Italy, or all these countries, you know, the, the traditional Mediterranean diet. So a lot of vegetables, whole grains, and beans, uh, you know, and, and less refined process and animal food. The other one, for example, is to stop eating well before you are completely full. It's called harabuchimi in Japanese, so stop when you are 80% full. Another one, you know, you know, we are studying in, 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 is to incorporate some fasting. Fasting is not pure fasting, but maybe once a week, you know, you can eat only vegetables. You know, in, in a study that we just finished at Barn Jewish Hospital in, in St. Louis before I moved here to Sydney, we, we basically randomized people for six months to fasting twice a week, and they could eat for lunch and dinner as many non-starchy raw or cooked vegetables as they wanted with two tablespoons of olive oil, and they lost 30 kilos, some people, in, in six months. I'm going to stop you there. This man is inspirational and lean and Italian. What could we not like about this man? <laughs> a number of you are taking detailed notes. Anyone with a question or comment so far, and it can be one of the people I've interviewed, I come to you with surprising rapidity. Give me the chance to move, guys. Anyone got a question for anything that's been said so far? Thank you. I was desperately hoping it would be someone at the back row because <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I just had a trip to Israel and I have got some belly fat. I put it down to too much of a good thing. Now, I never let go of the microphone, guys. I just hold it near your mouth. If you'd like to introduce yourself and ask your question or comment, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Edward Gorok. Um, I'd like to um, hear your opinion on um, coenzyme Q10 um, and um, also Reservatol. Could you explain what they are and then give your views? So Resveratrol is like a, a compound and phytochemical that you, you can found, find in, uh, in the grapes and... Uh, that has been started in, in uh, and you know, th they are kind of CR mimetics, color restriction mimetics. Now there is a lot of research into molecules that can mimic the effects of color restriction without doing color restriction. The data we have so far in animal studies, there are big studies in US, they don't work. Unfortunately, they don't work. 
What so was the first point? Could I just ask him what the first one was? Coenz coenzyme Q. What's that? What does that mean? It's another molecule supplement you can take, you know, that it has effects in, within the cells. But, you know, when we supplement animals with, with these uh, compounds, we don't see any extension in lifespan or health span. So what's your, if I could just move out, sir, your take-home message is to follow the sort of advice you've given, you do it with, with real whole food, not with supplements. Is that what you're saying? Food, exercise, you know, probably other people that are going to talk about the importance of sleep. There are new studies, for example, showing that, you know, if we don't sleep well or we have fragmentation of sleep, you know, p the, our neurons during the night, they, they, they fire and they, you have the position of beta amyloid and so that's a risk for dementia. So there are more things, you know, that, than, than food. But definitely in our studies, food is the most powerful intervention. Any other question or comment? Thank you. I'll just whiz over. If you could all breathe in, guys, I'm going to run across the front. And uh, I'll then take one more question or comment and then we'll come back to another panel member. Thank I you. If you could just introduce yourself. Thank, thank you. Uh, my name is Janet. Um, I'm asking this question because a question's already, it relates to this idea of supplements. And I'm very concerned about the way calcium and vitamin D supplements have been pushed at women over 50 for the last 20 years. In uh, Norman Swan's health report on ABC Radio on Monday night, um, it, there was a, a study showing that if you take more than 400 international units of vitamin D supplement, um, you are reducing your life expectancy and increasing the risk of um, death from cancer. Now, this isn't the first study that has shown dangers of taking vitamin D. Um, uh, the most commonly prescribed one in Sydney has 1,000 international units, and there are women like myself who have been pushed to use them for the last 15 years, and I am furious. I'll take that as a comment. If you go to ABC Radio National and go to the health report, you can listen to the program, which I happen to hear as well. Uh, uh, Professor Fontana, would you like to comment? Yeah, no, for vitamin D, really, there is not... I mean, for other supplements, like uh, vi vitamin C in smokers, there are... So, probably 20 years ago, there was this, 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 this idea uh, that, you know, antioxidants, vitamin C, beta-carotene, vitamin E, were the solution for many chronic diseases, cancer, and, uh, and animal studies were, in some way, supporting. Then, you know, we did randomized clinical trial, double-blind, and we didn't see any beneficial effects of supplementing with vitamin C, vitamin E, beta-carotene. And in some cases, like for beta-carotene or vitamin E, there was an increased risk of death for, for cancer. For vitamin D, I'm not aware of any studies showing uh, at the dose you are talking about uh, in, in, in increase, in, an increased risk of death. Uh, I think, you know, that it depends, you know, if you are living in North, in England or North America and during the winter you, you are not exposed to sun, I think, you know, we have to take a supplementation. It's the only supplement that I recommend during the winter, vitamin D, because, you know, we need vitamin D and unless you live, you know, again, you know, in, in Australia, I think, you know, during the winter you can expose yourself to the sun so you, you don't have a, a problem with vitamin D, but we need vitamin D for our bones and, and probably also for the immune function and and, and uh, for a healthy immune system and, and for preventing cancer. For, for bone, the data are clear because if you have low vitamin D and, and low calcium, you have an increase in PTH, that is this hormone that is basically increasing the reabsorption of bone. And so, but you know, I don't know where, where you uh, know, uh, this uh, study that you were mentioning, it's saying that there is an increased risk of death, you know, and no, there is nothing that I'm aware of. Look, thank you. I might ask you to pass the microphone to Associate Professor Amanda Third. Oh. <laughs> Here, I'll take one away. Um, I just want to say quickly in relation to this lady's comment, I, I did happen to hear that interview. And so if you have a particular interest in what was raised there, I do urge you to sit, go to the health report and listen to the podcast on ABC Radio National because my memory of it was it was quite credible research and did raise concerns about some of the recommendations that are made for older women. Uh, I'll just remind you, Associate Professor Amanda Third is particularly interested in young people and technology. Now, we've, you think there is value in technology and health for the young. Now, remember, our purpose tonight is to hit people with 
What are the critical key messages in an area where we're flooded with information? So we've got teenagers, either as children or grandchildren. What's your message about technology and health for the young? Well, my, my key message, and I say this, I'm holding in my belly fat, um, is that... Um, is that technology is not all bad for children and it's indeed not all bad for our health all the time. And we have to be, I think we need to um, think really creatively about technology's role in our everyday lives and indeed in what it might mean to you know, live healthily. Um, because technology, technology has all kinds of um, social benefits that we, that, that contribute to um, people's well-being. So in the case of young people, we know in this country that we have a mental health epidemic. One in, young, one in four young people has a serious mental health issue, um, you know, and, and so on. Um, but we also know that 90, uh, you know, 98% of young people are online and that this possibly offers us a really wonderful opportunity to, um, to reach large numbers of young people and expand their, their resources and their capacity for wellbeing. Can you give us some examples of, of the ways in which you believe technology can be beneficial? Absolutely. So I think one, one really um, wonderful example, which um, goes back almost 10 years now, I was researching with children with um, chronic illness or a disability. I was asked to go in and evaluate actually the Starlight Foundation's uh, livewire.org.au initiative. And that's a, an online community for children and young people living with chronic illness, um, a serious condition or, or a disability. And um, they said to me, we've got this idea, we've set up this community, um, we've connected all these kids, there are really stringent sign-up processes in place, so parents have to sign forms to enable their kids to go online, and so there were lots of hurdles for kids to go in. And then kids, once they were in that space, were not allowed to um, exchange personal information with one another, so they weren't allowed to share last names, they weren't allowed to share phone numbers, email addresses, social media handles, no other forms of connection with each other except in this one space. And I thought, as an expert on, on children's digital media practices, this, this can't work. Like, how can this possibly work? And yet, those children, and remember, children who not only, well, they probably don't have the kinds of opportunities to socialise and relate to one another, or to other people, rather, in the ways that, say, an average young person might, they thought in this space, they formed some of the most deepest or the deepest and most enduring friendships of their lives. And in fact, for many of them, it was the only deep and meaningful friendships they had formed with other young people their age. And that, we know that deep, meaningful friendships are a really strong protective factor for mental health and well-being. So I know that's a kind of a limit case, but it's a really powerful example. You know, these kids made life and death, literally life and death situa um, decisions together. So they would, you know, when they were offered um, the opportunity to undertake surgery, you know, they'd take on board all the advice of the doctors and their parents and all the other people in the hospital setting. Um, but this, this forum was, was a space where they kind of came online, they could be children, they could be kind of, their illness could be present but not focal. And they, could, um, and they could actually just be kids, make decisions, laugh with each other, have fun and so on. Now, obviously that's a... A, a, a targeted use of technology in a particular sub-community. I guess the thing that we often hear about in the media is concern about um, exposure to predatory adults or older children or uh, fear of social isolation through not engaging in face-to-face -face or group activity. What would you say to that, those worried parents, in terms of promoting healthy living for teenagers in particular and the use of technology. What's your basic advice? So I think, I think one of the biggest dilemmas that we face as parents is that we don't know where technology is taking us. We can't see the future. And the same thing about our kids. Like, we, we don't know where, how they're going to turn out. You know, when you combine children, the anxieties we have about our children with the anxieties or the technophobia we have, this is a recipe for a lot of anxiety. And that anxiety, uh, that anxiety is really unhealthy and it often gets in the way of us seeing um, not just the, um, 
you know, it gets in the way of us understanding what the benefits might be and how to tap into our children's in, um, media use in meaningful ways and to regulate that in meaningful ways that, um, so that, you know, like thinking about things, for example, how in the family you might um, consume digital media together or how siblings might use it together, etc. how you might use it to strengthen relationships, right? So, so um, there's a... There's a it, the technophobia is a really big problem and I think we've got to take a really good, hard, long look at it. So what's your advice to parents? Get, uh, take an active interest in what your children are doing and do things with them. Just as you might do sports with them, you do social media with them, you do yeah. games with them. Or is that what you're saying? Well, that's part of it. I think, you know, what, what's, um, what the evidence shows is that active mediation where parents get involved in their children's digital lives is really effective. It opens up spaces for conversations between adults and, you know, parents and children about what's appropriate, what's healthy, um, what's positive, those kinds of things. But I think the other thing is that um, what, we, what we often do to kids is we say, put that technology away, stop playing games. Don't, you know, don't look at the television. And what we don't do enough of is offering them viable alternatives that are lots and lots of fun. And there's one, there's one really interesting thing, I think, is that, you know, over the last sort of 35 years, if you talk to people our age, like, we look at young people now and their lives look radically different to the lives that we used to, we used to lead, right? They don't go, they don't walk to school anymore, they don't do the, you know, they don't go up to the shops for mum um, and, you know, they, we can't, kids can't hang out at shopping malls on their own anymore, you know, lots of spaces have closed down for children and young people around the world, or living in Western countries anyway. They're a lot more restricted to their, to their homes or, and then they get taken out to do structured activities, right? Um, and what this means is that actually young people don't have as many opportunities to socialise with one another face to face, right? They, they just don't. And so what do they do? They find that outlet for peers, you know, um, socialising with peers online. Actually when kids say that they are addicted to technology, because they've internalised a lot of adult language about, how, about their technology use. So when they say they're addicted, what they actually mean is that they're addicted to the relationships that they nurture through that technology. That's true of a young person with a mobile phone and it's true of a, a young boy who plays games online. So the focus is again still on relationships. Look, thank you very much. I, I just want to invite um, Dr. Karen Crute to come hurtling towards me. Where are you, Karen? Do you mind coming out? And, and the uh, the link to some degree is technology. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Karen is a clinical neuropsychologist uh, with the Centre for Healthy Aging at the University of New South Wales. What does that mean? What do you do? I'm currently working on a study to investigate computerised cognitive testing in older people. So we regularly need to evaluate whether somebody who's getting older is experiencing cognitive change or cognitive decline because that can assist with diagnosis, it can assist with providing services and so on. Um, but one of the things that's changed in the last 10 years is that there's been an introduction of computerised tests for cognition in uh, older adults, only there is absolutely no independent evaluation of those tests. Can you tell us um, what sort of tests, like my uh, elderly mother was quite often asked to spell world backwards, count from 100 by 7, hand up if anyone's asked you those questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being so honest. Uh, evidently we're no longer asked who the Australian Prime Minister is due to the frequency of change it's no longer considered a fair test. So are you meaning that there are now computerised tests which would take the place of, I think that's called a mini-mental, isn't it? Uh, exactly. So I can plead guilty to asking people to spell world backwards uh, and to do other things like counting backwards and saying the days of the week backwards and so on. Um, so now, yes, there are computerised versions. They're probably some better and some worse. The point is that we don't know how good or how poor they are because the only data we have comes from the companies that are selling those tests. So um, it's a little bit like uh, taking the advice of a drug company that's uh, manufacturing and selling a drug on the, the effectiveness of that drug. Now this woman wants to meet some of you and get you to come into her life and she's now going to tell you how and why. 
So we're running this particular study that I'm involved in is um, looking at whether older adults actually like using these tests. So some older adults have more computer experience, some have less. Uh, so we're very interested in when you do these tests, whether you like them or not. And the other question we're asking is how accurate they are. So whether they are as good as those old-fashioned mini-mental types of tests done with pen and paper. Uh, so I would love to meet you if you're interested in taking part in the research study, uh, if, you're over the age, if you're 60 or over, uh, if you can speak English fluently at a conversational level, and I'm particularly interested if you can speak another language. Uh, we're particularly hoping to include people who speak more than one language in the study. Um, and you'd need to come to the University of New South Wales on at least two occasions, do the tests, and then tell us as honestly as possible what you think about them. So it's, it's a way of understanding whether these new technologies are actually effective and whether people like them, how they feel about them. If you'd like to be involved in the study and you'd like some more information, I'd like you to talk to my two colleagues, Zara and Karen, over here at the end of the evening, or take the flyer outside home with you and give us a call. Because only some of us will join your group and come to the University of New South Wales and because some of us sitting at the bus stop or sometimes at home just practice counting back from 100 by 7, practice world backwards just in case. Can you give us just a couple of examples of what the computer test might ask us to do? Yeah, you might be asked to name an object. You might be asked to track an object on a screen and remember where it was last time you saw it. Uh, and you might be asked to do a more complicated version of that and remember where five or six or seven objects were last time you saw them, um, those sorts of things. And in what context are people using them in Sydney at the moment, these tests? Like, where might we come across them? Uh, you might come across them in... It, they're less used in clinical settings, but you might come across them in research studies. Uh, they're supposed to be... Uh, quick, effective ways of measuring cognition. And what we really hope we might find with this study is that some of these tests are very good, very quick, and people like doing them. And we want to try and weed out the ones that either people really hate them because they get stressed out about them, or they don't work. The, thank you so much for that. And I think we've all... No, don't, don't go away. Do I have to do push-ups? I'd love you to do push-ups. She's asked me, does she have to do push-ups? Is there anything physical you can do? I could squat for a long time. <laughs> Listen, we'll, well, we'll settle for a squat and I'll count to five. How about that? Go for it. One, two, three, four, five. That's fantastic. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Luigi, if you could tell me in a minute what you're going to do, for something physical that involves calorific restriction or anything like that. I might come to him and he's grinning at me, but we'd like it to be Italian if possible, just to bring that... But look... We're here uh, to talk about healthy living. You're an expert on healthy brains. We're varied ages here. Oh, sorry, I confiscate phones and give them to child protection workers. Can you turn that on? <laughs> Can you tell us two or three dead set evidence-based tips to help us keep cognitively alive and well? Well, we've already talked about exercise and nutrition, so I won't say anything about those. We know that... Uh, Cognitively stimulating activities are important at all ages. So you need to, to work hard cognitively. So things like learning a new skill, learning to play a musical instrument, learning a language, um, those kinds of things. So is it like the brain equivalent of sweat? I heard that if we can sweat for 10 minutes a day, seven days a week, we reduce... Well, you reduce everything, basically. Everything gets better. It's as simple as that. So... Should I study Latin, learn to play the, the cello, because that's the intellectual equivalent of sweating? Yes, it's about uh, creating really rich, elaborate thoughts and connecting different parts of the brain using different brain structures. Um, make, yeah, it is a type of workout. And the other thing that I think is relevant to our topics tonight is... Um, Learning something like um, an artistic hobby, learning to paint, learning to do calligraphy, those kinds of things are all... Um, they work your brain in, uh, in the sense of um, the brain cells will actually form new connections. The cells themselves will grow and they'll be more complex 
and they uh, communicate better with the other cells. Now that's called neuroplasticity, isn't it? So it's one of the things we've learned is no matter what age we are, if we do sweaty brain activities, we can develop new neural pathways, we can build more cells and connection. That's exactly right. So your brain has a lot of wonderful machinery for adapting to events in the environment and activities that you do yourself. So if you're doing the kinds of positive protective things for your brain, it helps your cells talk to each other and it helps those cells them grow and become um, richer in their connections with other cells. Would you do me a favour? Would you grab that chair, even though it's physical activity, sweat if you can, and bring it over there because I sense people might want to ask you a question and I'm going to introduce another microphone into the uh, situation. Thank you very much. If you could hold this one, Luigi, so we've got one in all directions. I've got someone from the arts and I've got a very interesting rabbi up my sleeve. But before I introduce them into our room, any questions or comments so far? We're remembering we've just heard quite a bit about young people and technology and also healthy brains. Any questions or comments? I'd love it if someone's doing something to keep their brain alive and you can share what you're doing because you think it's helping you. Any questions or comments? Thank you, sir. I'll just come over. I'm glad you I hope it's artistic. He looks artistic. I know I don't let go. Oh, you don't let go. Okay, good. Well, I did in 1967. It was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Michael Fisher, by the way. Um, the question I have is, how do you get rid of the abdominal fats? <laughs> Luigi, can you stand up while you tell us? I'm going to ask more than one person. Quick answer. How do you get rid of the abdominal fat? He doesn't know. Look at him. He's like a whippet. It's a combination of exercise and nutrition. So if you, if you are in a negative energy balance, you're losing body fat. And you're losing, you know, we did a study, uh, a one-year study where, you know, we randomized people to exercise or calorie restriction for a year. And, you know, we measured with magnetic resonance uh, the abdominal fat, both the subcute and visceral, and there was a 50% reduction in visceral fat in one year, both with exercise and nutrition. I, I, hold on, hold on. I'm just going to... Don't, one more, don't, don't, don't... Uh, How uh, you Ed, come over here. No, no. I want, I want action. You, look, this man, nearly 70. Did you see me punch him before? Do you want me to do it again? No, I don't think it's necessary. He's like a rock. There is no... Luigi, do you want to feel him? There's no fat. What do you do? I exercise every day and uh, I have a, a wife who cooks very healthy meals which are balanced and um, that's it. Come over, wife. You're, you're critical. Luigi told us she's the most important. You said diet is the most important. Would you introduce yourself? I'm Sue, Steve's wife. And, and tell us about your approach to shopping for food and cooking. Seriously, what do you do... Solid as a rock. <laughs> <laughs> I also exercise every day. Um, I'm very strict about what we eat. Um, I went to a nutritionist um, about 20 years ago now. I lost 15 kilos and I've kept them off all these years. And so the keys, if you're being really blunt, tell us bluntly blunt. the three steps to do what you and your husband achieve. Exercise, balanced diet, um, that's it. What does balanced diet mean? Get specific. Okay. Um, small portions, a bit of protein, a bit of um, carbohydrate and a bit of vegetables. What motivates you? Because we all know it, don't we? You're an, in you're an intellectual crowd, are you? Yes. Uh -huh. But we're not all looking like this pair, right? <laughs> so what motivates you? Did you have a scare in the family or...? No, absolutely not. Just pure vanity. <laughs> <laughs> Vanity and wanting to live well and enjoy every minute. Okay, so look in the mirror. That's your recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Can you, get, can you do anything on the ground? No. no, no okay. <laughs> Would you give them both a round of applause, please? <laughs> yes, it's just doing it. So did you want to ask another question of Luigi? Or? Um. No, no, you, no, you're right. Another question or comment, ladies and gentlemen. Just be so I... You, you feel that you're uh, suitably engaged. I'll just whiz along, if I may, if you could all just breathe in. 
and I'll come across. What's cruel is really active, but I've always been a tubby sort of a character. I, I don't let go. Everyone. <laughs> uh, the food, food manufacturers' objective is to sell as much of their product as possible. And one of the ways they do that is by adding a lot of sugar, colorants, uh, anything, anything that will make it taste better and sell more. They're not particularly worried about the health effects of, of their product. How can this be overcome? I'm not going to come to you, Luigi. I'm going to come to Jill Margot AM, who you'll remember is the health editor at the Australian Financial Review. That is a commercial publication. Newspapers are dropping like flies. What are you prepared to say in relation to the role of food manufacturers in the problem of achieving health? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is that unlike the other members of the, other members of the panel and speakers, I'm not an expert. I'm just a reporter. I just report on what other people do and say and other trends and theories. So firstly, on the question of a flat abdomen and the complete praise of being super lean, there are other theories too about longevity. And I, I don't, as I say, I'm not an expert, but I read a lot of stuff I read every day. I read reports on health that come across my desk. And I've seen quite often that actually it's not such a bad thing to be carrying a little bit of extra weight as you get older, if, uh, that it can be protective. T tell me what healthy living means to you personally. What does that mean? What are you aiming for in your life when you think, I'd like to live in a healthy way? What does that mean to you? Well, I think that you know, healthy, healthy living is a kind of mobile concept and it changes with age and environment and where you are. And um, I think that you, know, you, you can... It's, it's more interesting to ask what's not healthy living. No, I'm asking you what is healthy living. Well, I'm going to tell you what it, what it is in an absence. So if I was perfectly healthy and was physically healthy and was well connected, I had good air, I had good, good water, I had good sanitation, good food, I was living in a reasonable community, but I was living in a country that was entirely oppressive. I was living in, in, the, in the, cali the caliphate run by, run by ISIS. Would I be living a healthy life? I'd be anxious, I'd be concerned, I'd be worried about the security of my children you know, crossing a line, transgressions being punished very severely. That wouldn't be healthy living. So I think a kind of calmness of mind, you know, the Romans said, you know, healthy mind and a healthy body. I think a kind of a fo a central focus really is is, is having some kind of mental equilibrium. Right. And may I ask, do you feel you've got mental equilibrium? No, I don't. Right. <laughs> I have from time to time. I don't think it's an ongoing and constant state. So how would... I guess I'm just going... Because we're asking for action for our audience. Yeah. In your experience, what assists you and those you know to okay. achieve mental equilibrium? I've got, I've got a little bag of personal tricks to try and stay mentally... Um, I, th I feel physically okay. I do quite a lot of physical things to try and keep myself healthy. But um, what I so so what what I do in that these are personal little things, and they won't apply to everybody, and uh, they don't always work. So just with that caveat in mind, so uh, do you have a law degree? Just with the qualifications? <laughs> <that we're> no, <laughs> I don't. No. <laughs> no, go on, sorry. But uh, I'm a very careful journalist. <laughs> 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 nice and close to your mouth. Yeah. Okay. So um, the first thing I do is that, is that if I'm at work or I'm in, I'm in a situation where I have a conversation and I come away from it feeling a little bit un uneasy or uncomfortable, I'm talking about micro things I do. Instead of um, packing it away and continuing with what I'm doing, I give it a, a very quick post-mortem, what went wrong, and then I try and fix it. And only by doing that can I go forward. And I'll fix it with a... Um, a text, an email, or I'll walk across the office and tell or phone somebody. And then I feel relaxed and I can continue. That's the first thing that I do. And I really make that a habit. And I find it enormously helpful when it works. Another thing I do is that I have a, a kind of perspective adjuster. So if, something, if I'm feeling unappreciated or badly done by or something, something, something's happened and I'm kind of self-indulgent, I'm focused on myself and the deprivation thereof, I kind of try and, try and put it in a wider frame and compare it to other things. And that helps me. Those are two of those are two. Can of you give things. me an example of that, where you, something troubled you and you put it in a wider frame, just to illustrate? Well, so, you know, a, a simple thing is that you, you, don't, um, you don't get a... You order a meal and a restaurant doesn't look good and it's, it's, it's not what you wanted. And you think, actually, I'm so completely privileged to be sitting here 
choosing from a list and eating whatever I like. Another way, another form of perspective adjustment is that I was once fretting about something and a close friend to me said, you can look at it, it's so small. Think of the distance between the moon and the sun. And really, it, it sounds a bit trivial now, but in that moment, it seemed incredibly profound. So, Is there any, I'm loving your tricks. So what, do you have it one more, please? I do, but this is a trick. I have a few unorthodox tricks. And this is an unorthodox <laughs> trick. So since I, got, since I became older, I ran out of hormones, stopped producing estrogen, as women do after menopause. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether women should or should not take hormones post-menopausally. Post and um, it's controversial and it's not, not entirely settled, and I've read the literature. But what I do is I learned from a, a somebody in my family, an older woman in my family, what she did is that she would just take a very small micro doses every now and then when, just to keep her going. It's like a, almost a homeopathic dose. And so that's what, what I do. I just, I just take it from occasionally. <laughs> I get a prescription. I take it when I want and when I feel like it. And it keeps me, keeps me balanced. This is a true... I, I haven't read the Australian Financial Review enough. You haven't. And I'm going to change tonight. <laughs> Could you give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> Rabbi, could you come out, please? I, 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 we're trying to provide a smorgasbord of ideas and information for you tonight because the truth is we're flooded with information about health. We turn now, I hope, to the Torah and more. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, my name's Shaw Solomon. Um, I think I've done a few things. What you have down is probably what I've done in the past. Currently, I'm a rabbi of a synagogue um, here in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, Mizrahi in North Bondi. And, uh, and uh, 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 the rabbi has also had extensive experience teaching and uh, leading programs in Israel. He's served as a combat soldier and as a medic. And you've also founded a leadership program. Just in a nutshell, what's it called and what's that about? Oh, the, le the leadership program was a program called Shalhevet, which actually still runs today, um, much bigger than it was when I founded it. And it was taken over by a completely different um, organisation after I left to come here. Uh, but basically... We wanted to bring more sort of Zionist educators around the world, uh, religious Zionist educators, not just rabbis, but people in all sorts of positions of education. Um, and we thought there was a need to sort of promote a Ju Jewish education in the diaspora within Israel. Um, and that program sort of trains um, people to not just um, to give them the knowledge, but also give them the tools to be able to go out to different parts of the world and, and teach Judaism. Um, Jill Margot, in a sense, has clearly broadened the topic of living a healthy lifestyle beyond the individual to the social context. As you indicate, if you're in the caliphate, uh, it goes a long way beyond your individual activities to, to, to remain well. Uh, I, I feel in my contact with Jewish people and Jewish communities at the moment, the rise in anti-Semitism is causing a kind of communal lack of well-being. Uh, so firstly, your, your comment on that, uh, and then as a, as a community leader, as a rabbi naturally is, what can you do, what can, can we do to assist a whole community of healthy living and well-being? So uh, that, that's definitely true. Um, you know, both attacks that we've seen around the world, especially recently in the United States, um, and the threats that have happened in, in our own community are definitely pe making people more anxious. Um, we talk about mental health and making sure that you stay as stress-free as possible, that you sort of make sure to stay relaxed. Um, we, we try and encourage people on the one hand to be cautious, uh, but on the other hand to make sure not to overdo it. Um, you can go places, you can go for a jog, you can go for a run. Um, you know, we live in a beautiful country uh, that protects our rights um, and make sure that we're safe and secure. And so I think it's just about, and people have mentioned it here a couple of times, the balance. Uh, on the one hand, being cautious, but on the other hand, making sure that we don't lose perspective um, on what's important on a day-to-day -day level and trying to stay as stress-free as possible. And, and is it something that you and the people who are, are leaders within your, your synagogue, is it something people are consciously talking about and addressing? I, I, I don't just mean getting security guards, but I mean, I guess, the mental approach to, to the resilience required to deal with it. Um, not on a day-to-day -day level. I think definitely over the last couple of weeks it's become more of an issue. Uh, but I also think that we're not talking enough in our own synagogues about physical and mental health. Um, I'm definitely not. Um, so we talk about, you know, obviously 
There's a lot of talk today about anti-Semitism, but we're also, since that's the topic of tonight, I don't think we're talking enough about physical health, about being healthy. Rabbis are definitely not. I'm not getting enough exercise either. But um, yeah, So what have you been thinking as you sit here? What are the two or three messages you're taking away from tonight? So, so I've actually really enjoyed tonight just being a member of the audience, actually. Um, some of the tips here, some of the information, um, definitely things that I'm not really exposed to on a day-to-day -day level. Um, and and fr from a biblical or Torah perspective, um, it, you know, already from the times of the Torah, we're told, you know, there's nothing more important than, than life. You've got to guard your life. You've got to make sure that you're healthy. The best um, medicine is preventative. Maimonides, for example, who was not just a great Torah sage but also a physician, has a whole section um, in his code of law about maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Um, which people probably don't know. They think about Jewish food. I mean, you think about the festivals we have, right? Shavuot, you got cheesecake. Pesach, you got matzah and gefilte fish. Um, you know, Chanukah, you got the lakas. I mean, it's not exactly, I would say, a picture of um, health and, and physical fitness. Um, and, and so, therefore, we, we sort of, um, Judaism has been misunderstood that it, there is no focus on that, but I think that that's untrue. It's just that we, as sort of spiritual leaders, are not talking enough about it. We might not be doing enough about it ourselves as well, as I'm not. Um, is that something you'll think about after tonight? Oh, it's something I get from my wife every day, so don't worry. <laughs> I, I've been thinking about it already, but definitely some of the stuff that I've learned tonight, yeah, it's been fascinating. You, you made reference, we had a very quick chat before we started tonight about your work as a medic and also as a combat soldier and the, the focus on saving life uh, within the Israeli Defence Force. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, very quickly. I, I was a... Um, combat medic, e each part of the, um, co each combat unit in the IDF has a couple of, within the, within the unit, the person's not just a combat soldier, but also a medic if someone's injured, a time of war, or a specific operation. Um, I'm not going to go into details about, not because it's a big secret, but I don't really want to talk about the specific details, but what I'll say in general um, is that what I found amazing and inspiring throughout my time in the IDF is the um, emphasis put on preservation of life, on saving a life, uh, every, every human being's life at all costs, um, and something which is really important to emphasise and something that I found really inspiring and I think is a fundamental tenet of Judaism. And not an impression you'd get in reading most material in the Australian media. I mean, I don't mean to get political, just I happen to have just come back from a trip to Israel and the West Bank, so uh, I've, if I could reflect as a, a non-Jewish Australian reader, um, I don't feel we have a balanced media here. That is not the impression one has of the IDF in the Australian media. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I don't think it's... It's probably not just the Australian media, I'd say in Western media in general. Um, and that's why I think people who have been in the IDF sort of have an obligation to talk about, you know, what actually goes on um, and, and the things that they saw and the things that they were inspired by. Um, and part of, I think... Look, the truth is I don't talk that much about my time in the IDF and I got... A lot of the stories I have in the IDF are quite humorous, um, and I also try and put a more humorous spin on a very serious situation. Um, but it, I think it's also an obligation to fr from to share the truth and, and to show what was what's inspiring about Israel and the IDF. Can I just ask uh, one more question? Unless there's something else you'd like to say, but I. Uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, a Jewish friend, his mother recently died at nearly 101 and I went to her um, funeral at a synagogue and we went, is it Kaddish, is that how I say it? Kaddish. Kaddish. So we went to say some prayers after and while we were waiting for that part of the service, uh, a young uh, teenage girl came out to uh, read part of the Torah in Hebrew and uh, another baby came forward. To, well, it wasn't a christening because I'm a Christian, but whatever it was, there was a baby and then there was a teenage girl and there was dancing and the, and the whole family, was huge family was there. And I sp there was an absolute joy in that room. And so I suppose my question is in terms of living a healthy life, where does faith participation fit in that in your vision, not only within the Jewish community but other faith groups because there seemed a huge amount of social and family connection achieved through historic ritual. Oh, I think faith groups, and I think this has been shown, I haven't read a lot of it, but I think this has been shown through research, um, can very often keep people both physically and mentally fit. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but I do think there's been some research about it. Uh, and I think that's got a lot to do with sense of purpose and also sense of community that we're doing things together that we're looking out for each other I mean I guess that's also part of my job 
um, to look out for members of my community, but the concept of community in general in any faith-based group is that we look out for each other, which I think definitely, you know, we, we make sure, uh, both from a mental and physical health perspective, that people are okay, that people are doing all right, could we help them, you know, get better? Um, that, that's part of, you know, being part of a faith-based community or any community, really. So, yeah, I definitely think it plays a big role. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you give the uh, rabbi a round of applause? Thank you. Thanks, Danny. I'll hold it. Oh. You know, I don't let go. Oh. <laughs> uh, Anthony Lowy. Look, to broaden the discussion a bit, not only can't we take our children, uh, they can't be alone to school and uh, back and forth, what about the tension that we all live? The, the precariousness of walking in the street the worry about threats from being bombed in synagogues and in churches. There's like a, a, a universal tension, a vigilance, a hyper-vigilance that we now experience. So apart from our individual attempts to look after ourselves, there's a universal or intrinsic necessity to be vigilant, hyper-vigilant all the time. Now, how is that affecting our health? And what, what sort of advice would you give about on that? Thank you very much. What I might do, if I may, is come back to Steve Denenberg, not because you're a fitness trainer, sir, do you mind coming out, but more as a, you'll remember Steve said he was formerly the head of Jewish Care, weren't you? Just explain what Jewish Care is. Uh, Jewish Care is the major welfare organisation for the Jewish community of New South Wales, um, providing services for people with disability, uh, mental illness, families, and so on. I, I feel I had tried to raise the issues you're raising, sir, with the rabbi, but I wonder if you too, Steve, would respond to that concern about hypervigilance and the impact on the individual and the community. Yeah. Look, I, I think we need to uh, get a perspective on this. And we as a Jewish community have are hypersensitive to anti-Semitism, but I wouldn't want to be a Muslim living in Australia today. Um, I wouldn't want to be a Catholic living in Sri Lanka today. Um, the, the fact is that we've become a more divisive world uh, we are faced by confrontation, we are faced by extremism, and the only things we can do is to uh, embrace the values that we hold dear, share them uh, with our families, pass them on to our children, and understand that being part of a community that cares for itself and cares for others is the antidote to this extremism. That's my view. Could, could I just say, I don't know if there's anyone here from the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, but I, I, yes, have a round of applause for him, thank you. Um, I know that the uh, Jewish Board of Deputies have staff that work to build a uh, community connection uh, across the different community organisations, including with Muslim communities and Christian communities. They do interfaith tours of Israel and the West Bank. So it's very much a, an active reaching out. Um, for individuals, how can they contribute, do you think? What can we do as individuals to try to overcome that sort of anxiety? I think by being involved in things which are not uh, just insular, um, it's important to be part of your congregation. It's important to be part of your community. But it's also important to uh, involve yourself with situations, politics of the world. Looking at, uh, let's, let's face a, a particular example and saying uh, the forthcoming general election. In the electorate that we're facing, many people are making a decision about who they should vote for because one person happens to be a nice person and has had a connection with Israel. What I would say is, what you need to do is, what are the real issues that are facing your community, your family, and our country? And make a decision based on what the big issues are, not necessarily the personal ones. I think the fear that comes from this, um, if you like, uh, uh, fear that, we were talk that you were talking about, tends to make you turn inside. And tends to think, well, what's best for me? What's best for me and for my family? But what we should be doing is thinking about, well, how can I help others? How does this country become a better place? How does this world become a better place? Through all of the things we've been talking about, through fitness, physical involvement, mental involvement, <coughs> nutritional welfare for ourselves and others, making sure that supermarkets don't get away with selling stuff that's loaded with sugar. Uh, I think it's, it's, just aware, it's looking outwards as well as looking inwards to yourself uh, that is possibly the antidote to the way the world's going at the moment, which is not a very healthy place. 
Thank you very much. And uh, I think we should also take home his wife to do our cooking. It's just a suggestion. Look, could I ask um, uh, Dr Gail Kenning to come forward, please? Thank you, Gail. And I'm just quickly checking that I... Yes, I have. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and explain your engagement with the arts? Um, I'm a researcher in creativity, um, ageing and health, and I work at UNSW, um, Uni University of New South Wales, and University of Technology, Sydney. And we run a number of projects around thinking about how creativity supports quality of life, well-being, um, giving people meaningful engagement. Um, and those are the sorts of projects that I work with. What, what I was, why I've brought um, Gail up now is that we, uh, is partly so in response to your question about feelings of hypervigilance because one pro festival that's coming up is called the Big Anxiety Festival, which has already been on in uh, Sydney. But can you introduce it? What's that about and when will it be on? The Big Anxiety Festival's on in um, October, well, it begins in September through to November. And what's interesting about this type of arts festival is that it deals with some of the big issues we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the issues that may not be addressed in arts normally, mental health issues, suicide prevention, ageing, dementia, and that's the area that I'm working in. So we have a project in Wollara talking to seniors in the community to find out what it is they think about their community, what do they think about where they live, how they live, and why they live the way they do. And we're inviting people to come forward and, and get involved with that. So if anybody wants to be involved, please contact me. And as part of that, we're building a visualisation of an understanding of those conversations. So what will it look like? Will it be a physical thing somewhere? It will be a physical thing, but we have no idea what it will look like at the moment because we're, in the mo we're really just starting with this but it will be part of the festival. Um, and a, a different way of having these conversations is through creativity and exploration and thinking about things in these ways. I asked um, Gail earlier, could she give us some examples of how people might use creativity in whatever way to, to live a healthy life, to have healthy living? So can you give us one or two examples of people or groups you know and what they've done? I do a lot of work, um, arts engagement with Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, with a range of organisations. And that's where people are coming to the Art Gallery to look at um, artwork and also make artwork. And what we find straight away is when we talk to people about making artwork or looking at artwork, the first thing they say is, oh, I'm not creative, I don't know anything about this, or I can look at art but I can't make it. And I guess one of my missions is to seep creativity into people without them realising it. So give me an example. Well, often what we do when we do art-making activities, um, people are faced with that what piece of white paper and they will not pick up the pencil to, to make a mark. So often what we do is we put objects on a piece of paper. We put pens and pencils there. We put things on the chairs. So when people come in and sit down, they have to move things. Um, they have to move objects away from them. And as soon as you start that tactile activity of touching things, touching pencils, touching objects or textiles, you're already having an aesthetic engagement, a creative engagement. And often it's not a big step from picking up a pencil to making a mark. And once you've made one mark, you make another one. Um, you know, we can think about this in the way that we choose things that we wear, the way we arrange things in our houses. All of these are creative activities that often we do, but we don't pay attention to it. So if we could be more mindful about those little creative activities, actually what we find is that they can bring great pleasure in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's about a quality of life. So we've talked about longevity, but what we need is that quality, that mindfulness, and art activities and creative activities High-level activities, low-level creative activities are hugely important for that. Can I ask you just one or two things that you do in your life that you consider help you to have healthy living? Um, creativity is a big part of my everyday life. Um, but also as a researcher in a university, I spend a lot of time writing at a desk, at a computer. And I have a studio in Marrickville where I do my arts practice. And often I find that what I need to do is shape up, the, change the thinking. So I often go from my desk working on a computer and what I need to do then is I need to get my body active. 
I need to be thinking spatially. So, you know, I might go to the studio or if I'm at home, start working with materials, you know, and sometimes if I've got to do writing, I might go to the studio, but write on paper on the wall. Because when you're thinking spatially, it's a different activity, it engages your body, and that's what's also important about the arts, is that, you know, it, it engages your mind, it engages your emotions, it connects you with other people, it connects you with yourself but it connects you with your body. And I find that that's what I need often to do, is actually get that sense of, you know, my mind's active, but actually I need to be completely involved in what I'm doing. Thank you so much, thank you. Would you give her a round of applause? <laughs> We're very close to the finish, but has anyone got another question? Or is there someone thinking there's one very important thing that hasn't been mentioned? I'd be very grateful if you had that thought that you could say, have you got your hand up? Yes, thank you. So I'm just looking through the light. Do you mind standing up so we can stare at you? <laughs> I think one of the big things is just what everybody's been mentioning about knowing yourself as an individual. So we all have our own fears and anxieties and then these tend to feed into poor nutrition, no activity, and then we can use the arts and our faith and whatever it is that stimulates you to get involved in those activities and eat better or move better, sleep better, all those things and finding balance in your life is really important. And I think understanding that we are all different because what works for me might not work for you, but what works for you, we can both live a happy and healthy life, but the way we do it can be completely different, but we still achieve the same result. Okay, thank you so much, Cody. Thank you. Anyone else who feels there's something we've missed or a final question or comment? Sorry, I can't see through the light. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. I'll hold it, but you can lean forward. Okay. How do we, uh, on the Warper site, how do we identify this session? Okay, so on the Warper site, how do we identify this session? Ruth Guth, if you could come forward and represent Walper. This is Ruth Guth, ladies and gentlemen. Would you give her a round of applause? I won't let go even for you, Ruth. Not at this point. But t so this gentleman really wants to see the film that's made tonight. How do people do it? Um, in one or two months, it will be on our... It takes a little bit of time to produce it and to get it to us and to get it on the website. And you go to www.walpa.com.au slash videos. And then you will see it. She should be on the radio. And it will be under the heading of healthy living. Thank you so much, Ruth. If I could just say one quick thing, which has been mentioned, but if I could just close with it. I personally think Sydney is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And the opportunity to walk in bushland around Sydney Harbour, where there are extensive pathways, I, I personally find an enormous part of my own well-being. So I thought I'd just slip that in at the end. But ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hand back to Danny Goldman to close, but could you just give them a, a big round of applause, please? And I'll hand back over to Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And uh, Julie does such a wonderful job. Just like to everybody to give her another round of applause. Uh, also to our panellists, I'd like everybody and our special audience participators, another round of applause. Thank you very, very much. A prize? I've got a prize. I'm sorry. I forgot the prize. Go on. Can yeah. I do it now? Do it now. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about creativity, we've been talking about physical movement, we've been talking about the lot. In this room, I'm going to tell you how you can be one of three lucky people. You need to be a senior, but you can take it and give it to some senior person you know. You can dance with the Australian Ballet. It's for seniors, it's free, and there is an envelope under three seats. Can you look under your seat or the seats near you? Because you'll see that not all seats are full. And if you find an envelope, could you squeal with uncharacteristic delight? Can anyone find an envelope under their seat? Yes, one square of delight. Congratulations over there. We need two more. Ruth, can you assist? Ruth may know things. 
Yes, sir, you've got one. Excellent, we've got two ballerinas already. <laughs> Men in turtles. Is there a third? Yes, we've got it. Fantastic. So thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, sir. Uh, just before I uh, close this evening, um, I'd just like to advertise for our next wellbeing, which is actually on the 3rd of July. Uh, it is actually, I think our partners are Jewish Care, and it's on suicide prevention, uh, which, of course, is a, a very, very topical uh, topic uh, that needs to be aired and discussed. Uh, I can't believe the broad, how we've achieved such a broad discussion and conversation in 90 minutes. It's just been amazing to deal with uh, the, uh, the medical side of things, the faith side of things, uh, the stress. Um, it, 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 I, I'm just taken aback with what healthy living can actually be and what it can be involved. Uh, just thank you very, very much for your attendance. I'd like to thank the Walper staff, Ruth and Michelle, and uh, can you please record your contact details if we don't have them already. Um, and I'd like to also just mention another Walper uh, evening. Uh, you need to RSVP for this one, and it might be of some interest. It's actually being held at the hospital, and it's all about are your medicines hurting or helping you? Uh, it is on the 21st of May uh, from 6 to 7 p.m., and it will be conducted by Dr. Ben Basger, who you may or a lot of you may know, uh, is a clinical pharmacist based at the hospital. I also have just another uh, advertisement to make. Uh, next Wednesday, thank you, Josephine Holland, who chairs our Community Partnership Committee. Uh, the Friends of Walper are having a movie night uh, next Wednesday night um, at here, at the Advent Cinemas. Uh, it's Thursday, the 9th of May. I thought it was Wednesday, Josephine. Is it Wednesday or Thursday? It's Thursday, the 9th of May at 6.15, and uh, you can uh, buy tickets for that online, www.walper.com.au. And I'll just do a quick uh, acknowledgement of Nurse Watch, owned by Kate Spillway, who donated the Adventures with the Australian Ballet. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Look forward to seeing you on the 3rd of July at our next wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you.